My name is Pamela and I'll be your narrator on this bittersweet journey. You know how they say every story has a beginning? Mine starts on a rather idyllic note, a love story crafted for the modern age. But before you start thinking this is some sort of fairy tale, let me set the record straight. I'm no Cinderella and Jason, well, he's far from Prince Charming. Jason and I first met at a friend's party, one of those events where you walk in and instantly feel the room buzzing with laughter and chatter. Actually, as the my comps twirl, I was sitting at the bar, sipping on a mojito, contemplating the ups and downs of single life when he walked in. Was with dark hair, a playful smirk, and an air of confidence. Jason was the kind of guy you'd notice even in a crowd. But is this seat taken? He asked, pointing to the empty stool next to me. It's, it's all yours, I replied, sliding over to give him room. Our conversation kicked off effortlessly. We started talking about travel, then moved on to movies, and somehow ended up debating the merits of pineapple on pizza. I'd seize fair me. By the end of the evening, it was clear that the connection was real and palpable. Do you know, this has been one of the best conversations I've had in a long time, Jason said, gazing into my eyes. I could say the same. It's like we're cut from the same cloth. I responded, feeling an unspoken chemistry between us. He asked for my number, and the rest, as they say, is history. It's turned into weekends together. Weekends turned into vacations, and before we knew it, we were planning our wedding. Virtually a year later, we exchanged vows under a canopy of cherry blossoms, a natural chapel that made our love feel all the more sacred. Do you, Pamela, take Jason to be your lawfully wedded husband to have and hold from this day forward? I do, I said, my voice tinged with a joy so pure I thought it might break free. And do you? Jason, take Pamela to be your lawfully wedded wife to have and to hold from this day forward. I do, he echoed, and for a moment I truly believed that this was the beginning of a love story that would withstand the test of time. Our honeymoon was equally enchanting. We jetted off to Bali, where we spent our days exploring hidden beaches and our nights stargazing from the private deck of our overwater bungalow. The future looked incredibly bright, and as we dreamily discussed the children we would have and the house we would buy, it felt as though we were scripting a perfect life story. But they say the devil is in the details, don't they? It's easy to overlook the cracks when you're caught up in the magic of love and the thrill of new beginnings. The flaws and the red flags just seem like tiny specks on an otherwise immaculate canvas. In retrospect, I see now that even during those perfect days, there were signs. Jason had a way of turning conversations back to himself a sort of narcissistic streak that I mistook for that I mistook for self-assurance. And when he lost his job, he spun it as an opportunity to find himself, although he seemed to have little interest in actually looking. Dex and Stakirin, I was in love and love, I thought could conquer all how wrong I was, and how painfully clear that would become as we moved from this chapter of Iolic romance into a far darker, far more complicated phase of our lives. 
So there you have it, the picture-perfect love that set the stage for everything that followed. But remember, even the most beautiful paintings can hide a world of imperfections if you look close enough. And as you'll see, the cracks in our love story didn't take long to reveal themselves. After the honeymoon phase came the phase of actually building a life together, literally and figuratively. We had returned from Bali refreshed and ready to tackle the world as a unit. So around this time, we decided that we were ready to put down some roots and buy a house. Let's get a real tour, Pam Jason said one evening. We were sitting on the couch, cradling glasses of wine and scrolling through Zillow on his laptop. I agree. Let's do it. I replied, excited about this next chapter. It wasn't just about the house itself. It was about what the house represented. The future of family, a permanent marker of our commitment to each other. The hunt for our first home was almost as exhilarating as our courtship had been. Weekend after weekend, we would meet with our real tour. Oh, Karen, to tour available properties. Look at this one, Karen said one Sunday afternoon, gesturing towards a charming two-story with a white picket fence. It's got a beautiful backyard and a fully renovated kitchen, perfect for a growing family. He toured the house, and I could already see us in it. I pictured Sunday morning breakfasts in that modern kitchen, summer barbecues in that sprawling backyard, and Emily, our yet unborn daughter, taking her first steps in the spacious living room. Jason, can't you just see us here? Etchens, I said, my eyes lighting up as we stood in what could potentially be our future bedroom. Yeah, I can. Let's make an offer, he replied, wrapping his arm around my shoulders. We bought the house, and the feeling of holding those keys for the first time was indescribable. It's a dream coming true in the form of a small metal object. We moved in a couple of months later, and I couldn't have been happier. Well, my job in marketing was stable and well-paying. Jason was going through a difficult time career-wise. He had been laid off from his previous job and was struggling to find another one. Any luck today? I would ask him, trying to keep my voice as neutral as possible. No, he would respond, sounding increasingly frustrated. Up, but something will turn up, and I believed him, or rather, I wanted to believe him. But for a while, his lack of employment didn't seem like a red flag. People go through tough times, and it's the duty of a loving spouse to support them through it. Right? I had a steady income, and we were managing okay financially. Financially, my salary could sustain us, pay the mortgage, and even allow for a few small luxuries. At that point, I thought our love could overcome anything. I still viewed our life through rose-colored glasses. We even started talking about having a child, imagining how our family of two would soon become three. I think we're ready. Jason, I told him one night, the idea of becoming parents transforming into a serious discussion. Yeah, I think we are, he agreed, and the decision was made. Soon enough, I was pregnant. What I didn't realize was that the house, the stability, and even the child were all propping up a facade of normalcy and happiness that would soon crumble. 
but at that moment, surrounded by the four walls that encapsulated our dreams and our future, we felt invincible. Vistas unbeknownst to me, this house would not only be the setting for our family's happiest moments, but also the backdrop for the revelations that would tear our lives apart. Yet, in that chapter of our life, it all seemed so ideal. The about your Jason and I, building a life together, unaware of the cracks that had already begun forming in our foundation. Having a child has a way of reshaping your universe. Suddenly, it wasn't just about Jason and me anymore. It was about our little family. I became pregnant within a few months of us deciding to start a family, and we were ecstatic. So, have you thought about names? Jason asked one evening as we lounged in our living room. His eyes were gleaming with excitement. I have a list, I admitted, grinning. And for a girl, Emily, Itch for a boy. Fix Jack. Emily, it is then, he said warmly. I have a feeling it's going to be a girl. As it turns out, Jason was right. We welcomed our daughter Emily into the world nine months later. A tree from the moment I held her in my arms, life took on a whole new meaning. I found joy in her smiles, solace in her coos, and a new sense of purpose that went beyond work, beyond our house, and beyond myself. Nurture a brief period. Emily's birth seemed to bring Jason and me closer. We were both smitten by our little bundle of joy, and the early days were filled with diaper changes, midnight feedings, and a newfound sense of all for the life we had created. This is amazing. Pam, Jason whispered one night as we stood over Emily's crib, watching her sleep. We made her. We did. I agreed, feeling my eyes well up with emotion. It seemed as though our lives had found a new equilibrium. I turned to work after my maternity leave, still managing to climb the corporate ladder while embracing my new role as a mother. Jason, who had finally found a part-time job, seemed more content, sharing childcare responsibilities and helping around the house. However, behind this facade of domestic bliss, there were undercurrents of tension that I chose to ignore. Jason was often irritable. He was often irritable and seemed to withdraw into himself, escaping into video games or going out with friends more frequently. Sick. But I brushed it off, attributing his behavior to stress or fatigue. Is everything all right? I'd occasionally ask, concerned by his aloofness. Yeah, just tired, he would reply, offering a forced smile that failed to reach his eyes. I wanted to believe him, so I ignored the signs, the little nudges from my intuition that something wasn't quite right. Life went on, and Emily's first birthday, came around a milestone that we celebrated with close friends and family. It should have been a time of pure joy, but for some reason it became the precipice from which everything started to tumble down. It was during that winter, a time generally reserved for holidays and family get-togethers, that the first major crack appeared in the carefully constructed facade of our family life. We were at home supposed to be enjoying our winter vacation when Emily's teething troubles started. She cried incessantly, as babies do, but the stress of it all seemed to push Jason over the edge. 
And that was the beginning of the end of the life I thought we were building together. A power for us. I was about to discover that this new chapter in our lives wasn't the heartwarming family tale I had envisioned, but a far darker narrative that I could never have anticipated. Winter had settled in, leaving the world outside our windows a frosty table of snow and ice. It should have been cozy, the three of us ensconced in our warm home. But the atmosphere was anything but. Emily's teething pains had her irritable and weepy, and those cries seemed to strike Jason like physical blows. One fateful evening, Emily's cries reached a fever pitch. No amount of rocking, cooling, or baby Tylenol seemed to help. Jason's face grew more and more tense as he sat in front of his computer, seemingly trying to drown out the noise with his headphones. Jason, can you please help me? Maybe if you hold her, she'll calm down. I said, desperation edging my voice. I can't. Pam, I just can't. I'm fed up with this crying, he snapped, pulling off his headphones with a dramatic flourish. Jason, she's just a baby. She's in pain and she doesn't know any other way to tell us. I tried to reason with him. Yeah, well, I didn't sign up for this, he retorted, standing up abruptly. Didn't sign up for this. Jason, she's your daughter. He looked at me, his eyes devoid of the warmth I had once fallen in love with. I can't take it anymore. Cam, he said, his voice cold and detached. Before I could react, he grabbed his coat and keys and threw open the front door. Get out. Take Emily and get out. My mind reeled, unable to process what was happening. You can't be serious. I stammered. I am. Go and so clutching Emily tightly to my chest, I found myself stumbling through the biting cold, snowflakes catching in my hair and tears freezing on my cheeks. I felt as if the ground had been yanked from under me. Was this really happening? I walked aimlessly until I heard a voice calling out to me. Pamela, what on earth are you doing out here in the cold? It was Mrs. Thompson, our landlord and the owner of several properties in the area, including the one Jason had rented before we moved in together. She quickly ushered us into her car and then into her warm home. A train shook six plation. As I sat there sipping the hot tea, she prepared and feeling Emily finally relax in my arms. Mrs. Thompson and I started talking. That's when I learned the shocking truth. He told me he was alone, that he had no girlfriend, no wife. Mrs. Thompson said, referring to a girl she'd rented an apartment to, a girl Jason had been seeing. So he kicks his own family out in the cold for her. I asked, my voice tinged with disbelief and an emotion I hadn't felt in years. Rage. Yes, dear. I'm afraid so. She saw a picture of you and Emily and confronted him. Because when she learned the truth, she decided to look for you. Can't say I blame her. Mrs. Thompson said, and learned the truth. She decided to look for you. Can't say I blame her, Mrs. Thompson said. As I sat there, my heart pounding and my head spinning, it all became agonizingly clear. Just the irritability, the distance, the evasiveness, 
It all pointed to this unimaginable betrayal. The man I thought I knew, the life I thought we were building, the future I had envisioned, it was all a facade, a cruel illusion. Be Mrs. Thompson's words and my own newfound awareness acted like a chisel, deepening the cracks in the ideal picture of family life I'd held onto for so long. The Tully the Fishers had finally broken through the surface, leaving me staring at the crumbling ruins of my marriage. But amid the destruction, I felt something else, something that I hadn't felt in a long time. Of a sense of resolve. I looked at Emily sleeping peacefully now, her small face relaxed. I thought about the life she deserved and the example I wanted to set for her. I... This would be our new chapter, not the end of our story, but a twist in the plot leading us down a path we hadn't expected but would navigate nonetheless. My family may have been shattered, but it was not beyond repair. I would rebuild, if not for me, then for my daughter. So, I made a decision that would be the first step in tearing down the old to make way for the new. I was going to file for divorce, and as Emily and I spent a few more days in the warmth of Mrs. Thompson's home, I started laying the groundwork for a new life, a life where deceit had no place and where the love between a mother and her daughter could withstand any storm. Living with Mrs. Thompson was a bittersweet experience. Her home was filled with the kind of warmth an understanding that I hadn't felt in a long time. Emily seemed to sense the change in atmosphere. She was calmer, more relaxed. But the tension inside me continued to grow, fueled by the looming confrontation with Jason. You're going to have to face him eventually. Mrs. Thompson advised one. Excited evening as we sat in her living room. I know. I can't avoid it forever. I said, my eyes tracing the pattern on the carpet. Mrs. Thompson sighed. He's got a lot to answer for. But before you go off accusing, make sure you have all your ducks in a row. And by that, I mean consult a lawyer Make sure the house is legally yours, and that Emily's future is secure. Her words hit home. I took her advice to heart and arranged a consultation with a divorce attorney. He looked over our financial records, property documents, and most importantly, the evidence of Jason's betrayal. You have a strong case, the lawyer assured me, in fact, I recommend you file for divorce as soon as possible. So I did, and then I prepared myself for the confrontation. I rehearsed what I would say, steeling myself for the storm that was sure to come. The day finally arrived when Jason would face the wreckage he had caused. I waited for him at our house. Emily safely with Mrs. Thompson. This when he walked in, his face was a mixture of confusion and arrogance, as if he was still unaware of the world crumbling around him. What's this? He sneered, holding up the divorce papers that he'd found on the dining table. Eight. Jason is the end of us. I'm filing for divorce. He scoffed. You can't be serious. Watched all this because I needed a break. No, all of this because you lied, cheated, and threw your own family into the street. I know about her. Jism, I know everything. I replied, my voice steady. 
his face paled, and for the first time, I saw a crack in his facade. Pamela, I save it. There's nothing you can say that will change what you've done. He looked defeated, but then tried a different tactic. What about Emily? You'd break up her family. You broke this family. Jason, I'm just picking up pieces and starting anew. I never thought you'd actually have the guts to do it, he muttered. Well, you thought wrong? I proceeded to tell him about my discussion with the lawyer, how the house was now legally mine due to the evidence of his betrayal, and how he'd need to find a new place to live. Jason stood there, absorbing it all, a range of emotions flashing across his face. Disbelief, regret, and finally, resignation. He picked up a bag he'd packed earlier and walked towards the door. Timela, I'm cruised, he started to say, but then stopped himself, perhaps realizing that apologies were far too inadequate now. Just go. Jason, I said, and with that, he left. As I closed the door behind him, a feeling of finality washed over me. The chapter with Jason was closed. The facade finally shattered, revealing the ugly truth behind it. But even as the reality of his betrayal stung, another feeling began to bloom within me. Empowerment, empowerment. Fiction for the first time in years. I was the architect of my own destiny. It, it was a cruel revelation, the depths to which Jason had sunk, the lies he had told. But sometimes it takes a jarring wake-up call to make you realize your worth. As I stood there in the quiet of my reclaimed home, I knew this was not the end. It was a new beginning, a beginning where Emily and I would be the central characters and where love, respect, and truth would be the cornerstone of our lives. As I picked up my phone to call Mrs. Thompson to tell her that the deed was done, I felt a sense of relief wash over me. The hardest part was over. Now, it was time for me to script a new narrative, one that would do justice to the strong, resilient woman I had discovered within me and the bright, deserving daughter who looked up to me. The sun was setting, casting a golden glow over the room. It felt symbolic, like the universe was affirming my choice. Saints of trams, I was ready to turn the page to step into the next chapter, and I knew somehow it was going to be our best one yet. Just months passed like a blur, marked by a flurry of legal paperwork, court hearings, and adjustments to new routines. Mrs. Thompson remained our rock through it all, more like family than a landlord. I secured a more flexible job so I could spend time with Emily, who was growing more adorable by the day. It was like she knew we needed extra smiles and laughter to get through this period. The day the divorce was finalized felt surreal. My lawyer handed me the decree, his face offering a solemn but warm smile. Congratulations. Pamela, you're officially a free woman. Thank you. You have no idea how much this means to me, I said, holding back tears. You've been through a lot. Just make sure the next chapter is worth it, he said as we shook hands, and I left his office with the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders. Mommy happy Emily asked that evening, her little eyes peering up at me as we sat in our living room, now filled with new beginnings. Yes, darling. 
Ami is very happy, I said, holding her close. Mrs. Thompson hosted a small freedom party, as she called it, inviting a few close friends to celebrate this new chapter in our lives. As you know, I've seen a lot of tenants, and I've seen a lot of life stories unfold, Mrs. Thompson said, raising her glass. But rarely have I seen someone bounce back the way you have. Tamala, here's to new beginnings. New beginnings, we all echoed, clinking our glasses. The party was a simple affair, but it was perfect. For the first time in ages, I felt surrounded by love and sincerity. And then, amid the chatter and laughter, my phone buzzed. It was a text message from an unknown number and heard about the divorce. Can we talk? Jason? My thumb hovered over the keyboard, unsure of how to respond. Finally, I decided on two simple words. No thanks. Until reading the message, Ting deleting the message and blocking the number felt like the final piece in a complex puzzle. But it was the last step in purging my life of the negativity and betrayal that had haunted me for so long. Everything okay? Mrs. Thompson asked, noticing the quiet moment I had taken for myself. Better than okay? I replied. I think I finally closed a dark chapter in my life. And it's time to write a new one, full of whatever you want to fill it with, she said, her eyes twinkling. The following weeks were filled with new experiences. I enrolled Emily in a local daycare and began dedicating time to hobbies I'd long forgotten. I even started writing again pouring my journey onto paper as a testament to my newfound strength. Each word was a stitch in the tapestry of my new life, and it felt incredible to be the one holding the needle and thread. As summer arrived, bringing with it the warmth and light of longer days, Emily and I found ourselves at a local park. She giggled and clapped her hands as I pushed her on the swing, her laughter filling the air like a melody. I looked at her radiant face and then at the world around me, and it dawned on me that this was it. Mommy, hi! Emily squealed, her little feet kicking in delight as I pushed her higher. I higher and higher, just like us. I whispered, feeling a sense of peace settle over me. Life had thrown us curveballs, yes, but here we were. Swinging higher, soaring higher, not in spite of our past, but because of our past, but because of it. I felt Yuzian betrayal had been a catalyst, shattering illusions and forcing me to face some harsh truths. But out of that wreckage had emerged two stronger, happier people, bound by a love so pure that no betrayal could ever taint it. 